today I'm going to try fixing a Nintendo Switch OLED for my very first time. I got it from eBay for $150. Ooh. It wasn't powering up when I got it, so I decided to see if it would take a charge. Over time, the amount of current it pulled went up, which looked quite promising. But there's still nothing on the screen. Now listen to this. After charging for half an hour, it seems to turn on silently. What's going on with it? Let's dive in and find out, shall we? First, let's examine the condition of the device. As I mentioned, I bought it faulty from eBay, so it's important to check if there's any obvious damage on the outside, such as missing screws, scratches or anything else that stands out. I can't find any sign that suggests that this device has been opened before. The screws look untouched and the entire device appears to be in very good condition. Even the USB-C port looks flawless. You might wonder why I was touching the screen multiple times and just wanted to make sure that the device is off before I start opening it. I haven't heard any click sounds while touching it, so it's powered off. Time to disassemble our beauty and use the fix mat we reviewed in the last video to keep track of all the screws. This newly designed stand is much better than the flimsy stand on the old Nintendo Switch. We need to check if there's an SD card inside the console, otherwise we could break it during disassembly. Oops. I totally forgot to start the timer to see how long this will take. Let me quickly do that now. What a shame. Disgrace, shame, Ooh. humiliation. With the help of a pick, we can lift the back cover by prying around its edges. This looks much different on the inside compared to the old switch. I assume we need to remove both antennas first to proceed further. I will remove the tape first, but we'll keep it for reassembling later on. The next step is to disconnect the antennas from the PCB. For this I will use the flat side of the sputter. To take off the Wi-Fi antenna, simply remove the screws holding them down and then lift them up gently to take them out. The wire for the small antenna runs through the metal cover, so we need to be careful when removing it to avoid any damage. The rest of the screws can be quickly removed and then we can lift the back cover to reveal the inside of our OLED switch. A piece of black tape on one side was holding the cover in place. Before we proceed with anything else, it's crucial to disconnect the battery to prevent shorting out any components. Please make sure to do this every time you work on devices. At first glance, everything looks brilliant, but at the moment we can't see the entire motherboard because part of it is hidden beneath the daughterboard on the right side. Do you see the white square decal? I don't think it should have been penetrated by a screwdriver straight from the factory. Could it be that someone has been in here before? Let's find out. I will remove the screw to see what lies beneath it. So far so good. I will quickly remove the cooler to get a better view. I've definitely spotted something that could only have been caused by a human being. You're a monster! Did you spot it? Take a look here. The screen connector has some heat damage. It looks like someone melted it while hot soldering. Okay, let me try to get the ribbon cable out of the connector to check if it was also damaged. For this we will use our trusty microscope camera to get a better view. Wow! Yep, Lumet markers, this does indeed look horrible. That's surprising. I'm trying to open the connector with the help of the flat end of a sputter. It feels like it could break at any moment. I'm using a cotton swab soaked in IPA aka isopropyl alcohol to loosen some of the hardened flux for easier opening. Phew! The connector is unlocked and we can now safely remove the ribbon cable with the help of a pointy part of the sputter. Fortunately the cable itself looks good, which doesn't necessarily mean the OLED panel is working, but still these are good news. Here you can see the mess from another angle. I don't think that keeping this connector will be a viable solution for fixing our poor console. But anyway, let's continue to see if we can spot any more damage on the motherboard. 
Besides some flux residues, this side of the board looks fine. I mean, as we know, the switch started and we heard some click sounds. And the only thing that wasn't working was the screen. Maybe we should give it a try and reattach the ribbon cable of the screen. First let's give it a brief cleaning with a toothbrush and some IPA. Afterwards we reattach the ribbon cable. The idea is to boot the console while applying pressure on the connector hoping that the screen comes back to life. Fingers crossed. I place my finger on the connector and power it on. Look. Nice, the screen is not damaged and we should be good to go once we replace the connector. Whew. The connector we need is a FPC connector. After looking it up, I found out we need one with 43 pins. I have a bag with multiple connectors on hand, so let's see if we can find the right one. Murphy's Law is in full effect today. Of course, I have the 45 pin version, but not the needed 43 pin one. Ugh. This means I will have to order a spare part, but fortunately for you, it's merely a blink of an eye away. With a sprinkle of YouTube magic, the postman has already delivered the needed package. That was fast. And here hopefully is our needed connector inside. Oh, and I've got a little secret. I can see that you've been watching but haven't hit the subscribe button yet. If you're liking what you're seeing, could you do me a quick favor? Just tap the subscribe button below. This way you won't miss any of my future adventures. And hey, if you ever decide it's not for you anymore, unsubscribing is just as easy. Let's take a look inside the package. I bought 5 connectors in total, just to be on the safe side and to fill the gaps in my little connector collection. But before we can replace the connector, we need to free the motherboard from its prison. First, let us continue the timer for the last part of our mission. The next thing in our way is the fan, so let's remove it quickly. After removing the fan, we have to take off the USB-C port cover. This is a new feature on the OLED version. The old Nintendo Switch doesn't have a cover on top of the port. Does anyone know the reason for this addition? I would love to find out. The next part is one that I'm not a big fan of. We need to take off the delicate speaker connectors. Usually I use flat tweezers with some ridges for this job, which work pretty well for the older Nintendo Switch consoles. But with this one I often slip and end up risking damage to the fragile tiny wires, so I need to think of a different approach. While thinking about a good way to deal with the speaker connectors, I ended up unscrewing the remaining screws on the motherboard and disconnecting the remaining ribbon cables. I might have an idea. How about using a dental pick to push it out instead of pulling? Let's give that a try. Brilliant, that works perfectly. I think this will become my new technique for detaching them. If you don't have dental picks in your toolkit yet, I highly recommend adding them. They are quite versatile, I promise. Finally, time to remove the motherboard. It's a bit tricky to take out, but that won't stop me. I see something that could explain what the previous owner was attempting. What we have here is that someone removed the metal shield and snapped the bottom side of the metal frame. The only reason someone would do that is to install a mod chip. Let's take a look under the microscope to see what the rest looks like. Ugh, this looks really nasty. The gluey residue you see here is hardened flux, which I also use for soldering because it helps the solder flow better. However, it should be cleaned off after the job to prevent it from looking like this. The rest looks fine and I think the time has come to remove the old connector and resurrect the screen to its former glory. To remove the connector I will use hot air. However, we can't apply it directly from above because the black connector right next to it could easily melt. So the plan is to apply heat from the bottom side. To protect the IC on this side I'm going to try shielding it with aluminum tape.
Okay, I believe this will provide the necessary protection to accomplish our mission. We will apply heat from the bottom, which should make the connector become loose from the top. Here we go! I apply flux to ensure good solar flow. Remember, when soldering, always use flux. I should make t-shirts about this topic. Oh my god, I bought one of those t-shirts. The melted flap needs to be open to see the pins underneath. I should have done this before applying the flux. Time to fire up the hot air station and apply heat from the bottom. The bubbling you see here is a good sign that the solar is hot enough and is liquefying. Nice! The Connector of Ugliness is gone. Let's reapply some flux and add some leaded solar to lower the melting point. This helps with soldering the new connector in place because the solder will liquefy faster. A little cleaning job, but wait a moment, what is this? It looks like someone previously cut a trace and tried to redo it. This was probably also done because of a mud chip attempt. Or do we have a better explanation? As always, apply a fresh layer of flux and give it a short burst of hot air and then we can align the new connector on the board. This is probably the hardest part of the whole operation. The alignment is correct when the pins of the connector are directly above the pins of the board. Okay, let's see it from the bottom with the hot air soldering gun and see how it turns out. We will let it cool down and after that we will poke every pin to see if it has a solid connection. You can clearly see that the pin bends when I apply pressure to it, so this one needs an overhaul. The rest of the pins on the front side seem to be properly connected, as they won't move due to our poking torture. I did the same thing on the back side of the connector for the remaining pins. On this side I also found some pins that were not properly soldered. Trying to reach them with the soldering iron was challenging, as these pins are really tiny and only appear large under the microscope. One thing I want to point out here is that I'm not a professional. I'm just a hobbyist who enjoys tackling challenges and sharing what I learn with you guys. To be on the safe side, let's reflow the connector with hot air a second time. Just a little notch on the side and we should be all set. This time all pins are solid except for one. This one needs a little retouching with the soldering iron and then everything is fine. Give it a quick clean with some IPA to remove the remaining flux and the replacement should be complete. The aluminum tape we put on earlier can now come off. We are going to take a close look under the microscope and clean up this side too, getting rid of any sticky tape residue and the old crusty flux from before. Let's put everything back together to see if replacing the connector fixed our screen issue. I will fast forward this section for you so you don't get bored to death. Thank you, thank you very much. You are welcome. I'm nearly done with the reassembly, just need to tighten the last screw. We are done, let's stop the timer. 2 hours and 16 minutes, not too bad at all. Before powering on this beauty, I will give the screen a quick wipe with a cleaning agent. And now, the moment of truth. Powering it on and hoping for the best. Yes. I'm really amazed by how much of a difference the OLED screen makes compared to the old Nintendo Switch with an LCD screen. The screen itself is much bigger and the colors are really astonishing. What do you think? Was the previous connector damaged due to a mod chip installation? But why would you need hot air for that? The fact that someone had been inside this device before really surprised me, because it wasn't any evident at all. If you're into modding and looking for something experimental, 
I highly recommend watching this video. And as always, happy tinkering!